welcome everyone. We're about to start now with the little hall. If everyone can uh, tune in here, we're going to have a great discussion with Will Hall, and um, I was very happy to be asked to introduce Will, because to me, Will is uh, a wonderful force of nature. Uh, some of you that know Will know that he's someone who travels all over the world and uh, teaches and spreads the good word about humane care, and uh, when you hear some of his bio here briefly. He's a therapist, uh, trained uh, part of it through Arnie Mandel and the wonderful Jungian process work, but Will's also a survivor of a schizophrenia diagnosis. He's the uh, founder and host of Madness Radio. If you haven't checked that out, it's a wonderful uh, <coughs> resource. How many interviews have you done on Madness Radio now? 150 interviews. Uh, all cutting edge, this, uh, this movement that uh, gets referred to of the psychiatric survivor movement or the peer consumer survivor dissident therapist movement. Will is really one of the leaders, like I say, all over the world uh, teaching and sharing. He's uh, one of the co-founders of the Icarus Project, which is an amazing creation of Will's generation. Was co-coordinator uh, co huh? co 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 of, 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 of the Icarus Project, and Will wrote um, a really great book called Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off Psychiatric Medications. That I think has been translated in several languages. He's also uh, had been associated with the uh, the Freedom Center and does open dialogue training. He's been uh, certified by the Dialogic Institute. I think he's one of the few guys or people in the United States bringing open dialogue to the United States. So, uh, without further ado, let's turn it over to Will and hear what he has to say, and we'll have a, a discussion in about 30 minutes or so, just a free quitting, open it up for all of us. Thank you. really meaningful for me to be here personally and some of the friendships in this room when we talk about the movement this guy I've known you for like 16 years and um, just really grateful to be here I'm really grateful um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Um, I'm, uh, this is a, a very deep and meaningful lifelong honor for me to be invited here, to be sitting with colleagues of our new life and um, to be recognized. Um, so I really very, very deeply appreciative of Michael and everyone who's, who's here. Um, this guy I've known for 12 years. Um, okay, let's just take a break now. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I have a lot to say and um, I think there's there's probably two ways to pronounce Lang's name. There's the anglicized and the Scottish name. I'm, my heritage is also Scottish, so I'm, I'll say Lang. Um, you can have pronunciation diversity. Uh, I have 
an enormous challenge of speaking to. I, I gave Michael this title, and I didn't know. I didn't think he was going to go for it. And he's like, "Sure, <laughs> legacy of R.D. Lang and the future of the psychiatric survivor movement." Um, I mean, R.D. Lang is the atmosphere of the survivor movement. How can one really try and summarize or speak to that? Um, I myself, um, my own experiences of altered states and madness or whatever language you want to use that got me into hospitals and diagnosed, I still have many of those experiences. Some of them are the same, some of them are different, some of them. And my work as a therapist and, and working with, with families and individuals in my training is always based on my own capacity to enter into the experience of the other and try and identify and really get a sense of what it's like to be mad from that perspective. And I draw on my own experiences. And learning about Lang, I think he also did that. His, I guess his, probably his most famous book, The Divided Self, 1960, um, a lot of the case examples are anonymous. And it turns out a lot of those were actually him. He was bringing himself in. And um, so uh, from you know, a very early beginning of my involvement in this, there's been that resonance of being able to draw on what might be seen as the most worthless part of someone now becomes part of a gift or a talent or a capacity. And that's what the survivor movement has given me more than anything. So I'm very, very grateful to the survivor movement for, for being here. And um, there's a lot I want to say. I want to open it up. I want to talk some history, I want to talk some theory, I want to give my sense of where the survivor movement is um, and where it might be going. Um, I'm also, I, I, I made an outline of my talk and um, it turned into 26 pages. And so I don't think I'm going to have time to do all that. Uh, but I did put that on the internet. So there's some note cards on the table. You can go and download the outline for the talk that I didn't have. It's kind of like watching a movie about the film that wasn't made of Dune. Um, but so, and also I want to have a raffle. Uh, is that okay? Can I have a raffle? Yeah, I'm going to raffle off a copy of the Politics of Experience. So, okay. Um, so thank you for being here. And my first encounter with Lang was I was browsing a bookshop in New Mexico, and I came across not one of Lang's works, but an anthology of a journal called The Radical Therapist from the 60s, which was sort of a lot of Bay Area types, Claude Steiner, some other people who were very influenced by Lang. And that really set me on a very interesting uh, course in my life. And I should say that I do not have any experience of the performer Lang, except through audio and video recordings. I wasn't in his uh, presence. And so I have the, the kind of like the pop Lang, the reader's Lang. And I would say that there's many uh, Langs. There's no true Langianism. There's no what did he really think. Or, or maybe there is. I don't know. But I'm certainly not an expert. I'm just a fanboy, very much like, um, you know, influenced and shaped um, by Lang. And um, so there's a lot of different uh, Langs that we can talk about. And one of the things that really struck me most strongly was reading his autobiography, and this is a story that's been told quite a bit, and I think it speaks a lot to professionals, people who train as therapists. And I, I trained in a very kind of cool alternative counseling program, and then I flunked out of that one because <laughs> it wasn't cool and alternative enough, and then I went to a really cool and alternative counseling and didn't get my license, and still I, there were moments. And I think in these moments, um, Lang's own experience as a, as a doctor and getting trained as a doctor speak to that, because there was this one moment where he's in a lecture, and they're learning about physiology, and they're watching films um, of people, the digestive process of someone chewing food and eating it and going into their stomach. And um, he's watching this film, the digestive process, and he realizes it's an x-ray. It's an x-ray of someone chewing food, chewing, 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 swallowing, it goes down their throat into their stomach. And then he realizes that, wouldn't an x-ray kill somebody? 
there were x-rays for that long. X-rays are deadly. You want to take a brief flash of an x-ray. You don't take a film of someone. So he raises his hand, asks the lecturer, and the lecturer says, oh, these are films that were done in a Nazi concentration camp in medical torture experiments by the Nazis. Next question. <laughs> and that was his moment, I think, and um, of realizing that perhaps there is something going on to this thing called reality. And that's what I want to talk about, and that I think is really what's at the heart of the legacy of, the, of Lang and the survivor movement. Uh, one of his early mentors was a Jewish neurosurgeon, Joseph Shorstein, who fled the Nazis. And Shorstein was very much steeped in the tradition of, of Western philosophy, studied Heidegger. Um, why is it whenever I Google Heidegger, the, the autocorrect changes it to headgear? <laughs> why is that? How, how do I change that setting? Um, so, um, so Lang was exposed to all this philosophy and existentialism, which was really the thing at the time. And Shorstein was a very, very interesting man. He, was, um, he recognized like a lot of the European philosophical tradition recognized that what gave rise to Nazism was a deeper mindset, an attitude towards nature and the self. Something was going on in the way that civilization thinks and acts about reality, and that's what gave rise to Nazism. Not the bad guys took power, something deeper. What was that? Shorstein was a very early opponent of lobotomies. This was back when lobotomies were done routinely. In fact, the, the person who invented the was given a Nobel Prize for Medicine, and Shorstein in the 40s was an opponent. Shorstein was also Jewish, and Lang grew up in um, working class Glasgow, Scotland, incredibly anti-Jewish, racist environment, rabidly racist. And so Shorstein had an incredible influence on Lang to make sense of what is this reality? I mean, here's this incredible mentor who's also one of them. Here is the medical procedure, procedural lobotomy that's normalized that I'm being asked to participate in as a medical science, and here he's an opponent of it. And so that's really the beginning of his intellectual journey as a, as a philosopher. And he met some of the colleagues of Jung. He met um, uh, a lot of the, um, uh, he was very much uh, into Sartre and existentialism. And so he um, came into contact very early with the Western philosophical tradition, which is very interesting to study because those of us who are into Buddhism and Eastern philosophy and yoga and Zen and mindfulness, there is actually a parallel tradition in Western philosophy that does exactly the same thing, experientially, as far as I'm concerned. It reaches the same kind of sensibility. In fact, there's some scholarship that shows that Heidegger was may have been influenced by Jesuit missionaries bringing back um, Buddhist thinking. So um, uh, he gets a kind of an Eastern take from the West's own version of that Eastern philosophy. And, and then there's Lang, the clinical writer and the theorist. And he was also not just alone. He was also carried by people who were very much looking at therapy for schizophrenia and the meaning of schizophrenia, Frieda from Reichman, Harry Stack Sol Sullivan, Winnicott, the Tavistock Clinic, all the whole psychoanalytic tradition was looking at the meaning in, in, um, in psychosis and where it comes from. And again, the divided self was this huge pop culture success because of its lucidity. It was so well written. And um, it was also turned down by five publishers. You may not know that, but it had these incredible gems. Like there, I found two sentences. If they just taught these two sentences in graduate school, it would completely revolutionize psychiatry. Um, psych schizophrenia cannot be understood without understanding despair. The experience and behavior that gets, labeled schizophrenia, that gets labeled schizophrenia is a special strategy that a person invents in order to live in an unlivable situation. Or say that one again. The experience and behavior that gets labeled schizophrenia is a special strategy that a person invents in order to live in an unlivable situation. The quote is just so, what is this unlivability? What is this situation? That's what we need to look at. So um, he also was very influenced by Gregory Bateson's work on family therapy communication. And he's, one of his quotes is, we are all in a post hypnotic trance induced in early infancy. So he had a very strong critique of the family, which I think was part of his appeal in the 60s and 70s, but he wasn't a blamer. That's a misunderstanding, I think, of the tradition. He says, nor is it a matter of laying the blame at anyone's door. 
Very seldom is it a question of contrived, deliberate, cynical lies or ruthless intention. So I was also very early influenced by Irving Goffman. If you've ever read Asylums or Stigma or um, Presentation of Self in every, Everyday Life, this helps you kind of decode some of what's going on in paranoia, which I think is a hyper-awareness of some of the things that Goffman was studying. So um, there was also Lang, the clinical innovator, and that's probably going to be a lot of our focus in this seminar. Before Kingsley, he did something called the Rumpus Room in one of the, psych of the psychiatric hospitals that he was um, uh, a doctor in. And this was back in the 50s, where the people there were not allowed to wear makeup or have underwear. The nurses were not allowed to interact with the patients. All he did was give them a room to go to where women could put makeup on, they could wear ordinary clothes, and the nurses were allowed to talk to them. And this revolutionized the culture of the hospital. A lot of people were discharged after that happened. Um, and he also would be instructed to go and give someone an injection in their padded cell. And he would just go in because the person is too crazy and they need to be calm. He would go down. Instead of giving them the shot, he would just talk to them for a while. And then they didn't need the injection. And actually, I read at one point, he, there was a, a young man who was very, very distressed. And Lang was about to go away for the weekend. He realized if he went away for the weekend, the man would likely get lobotomy or electroshock or be committed. And so he invited the man to come and stay at his home with him. So he's a real clinical innovator. And um, of course, Kingsley Hall, we're going to be talking a lot about. Kingsley Hall was maybe different than so Soteria is more maybe more of a treatment environment. Kingsley Hall, from what I understand, was more like a pop commune. There was a big emphasis on. Um, breaking down the distinction between the staff and the, and the patients there. And a lot of sort of famous celebrities in the 60s came through Kingsley Hall because it was sort of this hip thing. I think Sean Connery came through. His fellow Scotsman Sean Connery came through Kingsley Hall. And what I read was that, that Sean Connery and, and R.D. Lang were actually wrestling on the floor of Kingsley Hall. Yeah, what an image. Sean Connery and R.D. Lang wrestling. Getting kind of turned on thinking about that. Wow. Okay. So, um, so, so maybe that speaks a little bit to um, another side of language that he was also kind of a macho shithead drunk. I mean, that was. I mean, let's be honest. Unfortunately, we remember that part of him. We don't remember these other parts. But there were some pretty, pretty extreme stories and things that I, I've heard. Getting booed off stage, drinking. Um, but um, you know, Mark. Apparently, he was invited onto a TV talk show with Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist. Margaret Mead refused to go on the talk show with him because she heard that he had left his wife and five children. He had 10 children, and one of his sons said, was quoted as saying, it's really ironic that here's this man who's famous for family therapy, but he took no interest in his own family. So there's something going on there. And I also understand that when Lang went to India, there was a big, Timothy Leary went to India, the Beatles went to India, and when Lang went to India, he hung out with this um, with this guru, um, this mystic, Gangotri Baba, who was living on a mountain crag in, in nowhere. And people would come and give him food. And he hung out with Gangotri Baba. And Gangotri Baba, Baba was a devotee of Kali. People may or may not know who Kali was. Um, Ramakrishna says, my mother is the principle of consciousness. She is Akanda Satchitananda. Indivisible reality, awareness, and bliss. The night sky between the stars is perfectly black. The waters of the ocean depths are the same. The infinite is always mysterious dark. This inebriating darkness is my beloved Kali. So perhaps this is part of Lang's genius, to surrender himself to that inebriating darkness and bring that kind of wild, wild character in. And there was also the pop culture icon, Lang. He was in Life magazine. He, did, he toured in 72. He's a bit of a, a rock star. He was very closely related to a big <coughs> cultural event that was happening in the 60s that could be summarized in three words, LSD. <laughs> um, so apparently, he was you know, using a lot of it. Kingsley Hall used a lot of it. And um, so as we know, that whole history persists, its influence psychedelic 60s era persists. Lang's influence, I would suggest, I've never actually researched this, but exists extensively in world culture underground, but it's not recognized as such. For example, people know the album Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. 
third. Oh, come on. Oh, it's scary. People don't know this yes. album. Okay, yes, they do know. Okay. Um, listen to it if you have not heard it. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful rock album. It's the third most selling album in the history of rock music. The themes are very lang themes, and one of the songs is taken from a title of Lang's um, essay, Us and Them, and it's actually it's one of the only rock star rock, rock songs I know that has a statement against lobotomy. So he has this influence, and um, and then there's the for the post Lang Lang we don't we, part we don't the Lang we don't really hear about that much. He's very into birth trauma. He's a beautiful film about birthing. It wasn't didn't really present an analysis of childbirth. It just said it just interviewed women about getting giving birth, and then showed a medical birth and showed a home birth and let the viewer really reach their own conclusions about what was going on there. So he was into uh, rebirthing and was very influenced by Stan Groff and taking the psychedelic um, experience, the journey and the renewal into um, breathwork. So I want to talk about um, a Lang that maybe, maybe Lang gets neutralized and gets sanitized a little bit the way we kind of neutralize and, and sanitize a lot of the leaders of the 60s, like Dr. King, we remember it as the opponent of, of um, uh, uh, lunch counter segregation. We don't remember that he was about to come out in a big way against the Vietnam War and organize all the poor people in the country to march on Washington against war, racism, and poverty, and that's why he got assassinated. We don't quite hear about that side of him. So I think some of the more radical revolutionary side of, of Lang isn't talked about as much, but that's what's been deeply influential to me, and I want to talk about that. And um, Lang is very influenced by Herbert Marcuse, um, Marxist psychoanalyst who critiqued communism as much as capitalism, very relieving for those of us who don't want to be on either side of that battle. Marcuse said that consumerism was a new form of slavery, and since the beginning of ecological consciousness, and it's kind of like the totalitarian communist states, you have Orwell's 1984 totalitarianism, where the slaves are obedient because they fear their masters. Brave New World style is the consumerist style where the slaves are obedient because we love our servitude. We love our consumers when we become consumers. So um, he was very influenced by Marcuse, and there was this event that happened in 1967. And when I found out about this, I was really blown away. The 1967 Congress on the Dialectics of Liberation. It was a, it was a con Congress in London that combined politicos and culture wizards. Lang was there, the Buddhist um, monk Thich Nhat Hanh, you may know of, was there, Stokely Carmichael um, was there, Gregory Bateson, Paul Goodman, Julian Beck, Marcuse, and Allen Ginsberg, um, the beat poet, kind of summarized the zeitgeist of that moment when he said, what's going on? I don't know what the fuck is happening. Like, my world system is crumbling. It's kind of like, now, what is going on? So I think it's, there's a, a resonance there. And I think that if we really want to answer this question, what do we do with Lang's legacy as, as a psychiatric survivor movement, I think we have to bring together in our minds simultaneously, in our minds simultaneously, we're going to bring together Gregory Bateson's systems theory, ecology, holism, Thich Nhat Hanh's Buddhist activist nonviolence, black power revolution against racism, the critique of consumerist capitalism, the sexual poetic liberation of Allen Ginsberg, and the neo-Dada performance art of Julian Beck. So can you put all of that together in your mind to answer the question of where do we go from here? But first, let's do a raffle. Let's do the raffle. All right. Um, who? Uh, okay. How are we going to do this? We're going to do this. I'm raffling off this copy of the Politics of Experience. So um, we're going to do this. How should I do this? Telepathy. That's how we're going to do it. Okay. Okay. So I'm thinking of a number between one and a million. And okay, so everybody think of a number between one and a million. Okay. And then I'm going to say the number is honor system telepathy. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say the number and then whoever's closest gets the. Ready? Okay, ready? 327,111. Who's close? I have 333. Okay, anybody closer than Bob Whitaker? 802. Eight, you got 802,000? 
you're very not, you don't even qualify. You're not anywhere near. Anybody close to 327,111? I think it's Bob Whitaker's. Congratulations. All right. All right. Okay. I'm going to stand up for this next part. Um, uh, So Lang wrote, normal men, and he means men, normal men have killed perhaps 100 million of their fellow normal men in the last 50 years. So that's what normalcy is. That's what Lang is struggling with. We are effectively destroying ourselves by violence masquerading as love. And that can be read as a, as, a, as a critique of the family. It's really about society. The powerful genius of Lang, for me, is how you look at society, you look at the violence that's going on, the ongoing wars, the uh, poverty, the racism, and he doesn't say that's them doing that. That's them, the oppressors. He says it's us. It's us. This is what Lang is, I feel the legacy of Lang is really speaking to. The violence of society comes from the interpersonal violence that we do to ourselves and to each other by violating our experience. The sixth extinction, the mass extinction of life on Earth is happening right now. How many million people are in the prison system? We're in a situation with the prison system in this country where prison rape is so widespread and accepted that it's become a joke in popular culture. It's become an acceptable thing to joke about prison rape in popular culture. One of Lang's favorite quotes from Heidegger was, the dreadful has already happened. And that's the challenge that I want to live with. I want to live with the challenge of, of, of facing the violence that our society, the world, is engulfed in right now. I want to live with that challenge. And it's a moral, incredible moral burden. It's, we need to feel it as oppressively as the heat in this room right now. And it's okay to say, I'm failing to meet that challenge. But it's not okay to say, I give up on meeting that challenge. So, um, Lang, at the time, there was a big focus on destruction and extinction and fear that, that nuclear war was going to happen. But let's not use the fact that communism has collapsed as a way of, of dodging this challenge, because we are not only on the brink of destruction, we're in destruction. It is happening. It is, it is happening. He writes, only by the most outrageous violation of ourselves have we achieved our capacity to live in relative adjustment to a civilization apparently driven to its own destruction. I, I, I'm, I'm someone who's driven by synchronicity. I, I study synchronicities, I watch synchronicities, I follow synchronicities. As I was developing this talk, there's stuff coming out in the media about how the royals in the UK, you may have seen this in the newspaper, had all these links to the Nazis. They were, some of them, the royal family in the UK were big fans of the, of the Nazis. Some photos of them hanging out together. Shorstein, going back to Lang's mentor, Shorstein was deeply concerned about the underlying attitude of science and knowledge and technology that gave the Nazis the capacity to do the Holocaust. He was concerned that that underlying science and technology was itself exterminous, destructive, driving us to extinction. That, I think, is the challenge that we're facing, that this technological project of purification and control and dominating nature manipulating nature, eugenics, that continues. And in fact, if you study the history 
of the Nazi era, there are many, many business and political and military interests that persist after World War II. So this is the depths of the moral challenge that we're facing. And I also want to say this goes to the violence in our lives. It goes into the personal violence that happens to us every day. The capacity, I doubt, if there is a single person in this room, and myself and included, who has not hurt someone very badly that they love. That we live in a society where we hurt the people that we love. And we continue and we accept this as normal because we've got other things. We do our best, I'm doing the best I can. We accept it as normal that we walk by people. I walk by people in the streets who are starving, who are homeless, and I don't stop. I pass them by. We accept as normal the massive brain injury of psychiatric drugging that is happening in this society. Because we have accepted as normal the massive toxic poisoning of the whole society. These are, I don't need to remind you of these. Shut up, Will. I don't need to remind you of these things. Shut up, Will. Shut up, Will. Shut up. You can't. You're trying to inspire these people to really tune in to like ecology and the prison system and war and the entire big picture of violence and connect it to their personal lives and then just say that they should study our delay and really see how these things are connected and we can work against it together. That's, that's just, just shut up. You can't do that. Stop doing it. You can't do it. You need to shut up and tone it down and make it more under control and say something people can understand. They're going to fucking sleep. Look at them. They, they've heard this already. You're failing to do this. You can't actually present the big picture that your vision that you say has a synchronicity on television connects you with. You can't actually fucking do it. Shut up. Don't shut up. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Fuck, don't talk to me like that. You're wrong. I'm absolutely going to keep doing what I do. And, I, and I'm right. And you know what? You just, okay, great, fine. Great. I'm just going to go over here now. Treat me like that. I'm part of you. Yes. Yes. When you come at me like that, I can't handle it. I, I, I can't handle it. I, I, I need you to not be mean to me. I need you to not be mean to me. I know that I'm failing. I know that I cannot grab hold of this whole thing and be a human being. I, 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 I know that. I know that. I, I, I help take care of a three-year-old. What is the world going to be like when he gets to be my age? I, I know that I'm just not doing it for him. I'm just failing. I focus on my own little world. I focus on my survival and my career, my whatever. I realize that I'm failing, but I don't need you to attack me for that. I don't need you to be mean to me for that. I'm a human being. I'm trying. All these people here are trying. We're really trying to be really somewhere. In spite of the heat and the format and everything, we really, 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 really do want to not be violent. So give us a break. We're human beings. And I tell you what, I need you. I need your anger. I need your passion. I need your intensity. I really need you. Can we make a deal that I'll listen to you if you're not mean to me? Yeah, you know, maybe, but, okay, I know you don't like to be pointed at, okay? <laughs> Understand. But you and everybody here have got to start making some more, you got to start taking more risks for what you really believe in. If you really believe in love and, 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 and helping the world around about this violence, take some more risks. People are fucking dying. The earth is falling apart. I mean, come on. Don't need me to lay a list of it. Technology is rebelling.
Yeah, I'll take, I'll take some more risks. Some more risks. So can I go back to my, can I go back to my talk? Look, you gotta make it short. You gotta get to the fucking point, okay? Because <laughs> the time, you have everybody's, you don't know what's going on over there. Like, okay, I'm gonna get, I got 26 pages here, but I will get through it. Okay, so, um, <laughs> the legacy of Lang, psychiatric survivor movement. Um, what's interesting is if you, if you study the psychiatric survivor movement, it's really the early 70s, 71, 72, with the groups like the Madness Network News and the Insane Liberation Front, all of them using the language of the 60s. A lot of them were inspired by Lang. That the radical movement in psychiatry helped give birth to the modern psychiatric survivor movement. I never knew that. And I think that's one of the things I'm going to be talking about. Because if anything, this gathering will help us to honor the legacy of Lang. And I want to start honoring that legacy more, recognizing his, um, his contribution. And what's, I think, significant about, I mean, for example, in 1964, in the, sch the schizophrenic experience, Lang calls for patients to guide other patients through the experience of madness. Judy Chamberlain, in On Our Own, talks about that only 14 years later. So there's this underground history, secret history that I think we need to, to claim. And today, the psychiatric survivor, if I was going to sum it up, you just have to look at the language that's used. It's no longer the psychiatric. In fact, if you look historically, it wasn't even called the psychiatric survivor movement. It was the ex-inmates movement. It was a prisoner movement. It started out as a prisoner <laughs> movement. And now it's called the consumer movement, the peer movement, people with lived experience. The surest way to sabotage a movement is to make its language unintelligible to ordinary people. The psychiatric survivor movement has been largely co-opted. It's lost touch with that impulse. And one of the things that Lang said, he said that more completely, more radically than anywhere else in society, the schizophrenic is invalidated as a human being. When you've been through that experience, you've experienced the extreme limit of what violence is. And I think that's one of the reasons we can't agree on a name for our movement, because we're so sensitive to that domination and that control and that repeating of that violent impulse. And so potentially, the psychiatric survivor movement can play this very, very powerful role. And part of that is understanding a deeper co-optation dynamic that goes on. People ask me about how did I get from being someone who's in hospitals to doing work and how do I get a career as a therapist, I give you a secret to my success. If, you wanna, if you're a mental patient and you want to make it among professionals and conferences and events, don't get angry. Don't get angry. I've learned how to modulate my anger. Because the reality is that there's, I have to be careful about to not offend professionals. Professional allies, really cool people. I have to be really careful to not offend them. Because I will break that trust. I have to be I have to go around them. I have to take care of them, not you know, blame them. I can't show my anger. Now, every movement is based on anger. That's what movements take that, that, that rage and then transform it into something positive. That's what the whole theory of nonviolence is all about. So that's a big co-optation dynamic, and I play part of that. And I so studying this, I was thinking about this, and I was recognizing, it goes back to what Lang said about schizophrenics being the most invalidated of all. Because really, when we want to invalidate someone, what do we do? We want to just completely invalidate everything. We call them crazy. We call them crazy. We call them crazy. In fact, there's you know, crazy, crazy bitch, crazy faggot, crazy nigger. Where's the equivalent crazy white man? Crazy honky? No, there's no equivalent. Craziness is the moment of rebellion. And not to romanticize that. Well, I grew up in the South, and it was very, it was really understood what it was to be a crazy nigger. That was someone who was black and marked as black and not passing and who didn't play by the rules and offended white people, spoke back, didn't step aside on the pay, on the sidewalk, did something speaking too openly, vent their anger. 
once you were labeled crazy, lynching, killing, assassination. So there's a deep, deep connection here between all the social oppressions and what it is to be labeled crazy. And that's the violence of experience, the violence of invalidating someone's experience. And that's what Lang says is really the essence of the problem with technological society, that we're based on evidence. We're not based on experience. We're not based on people coming together in a relationship. We're based on people coming together as statistics. I don't like you anymore. I like you. That's where we're going as a society, very, very rapidly. Very, very rapidly. And I'm learning about my own paranoia, my own madness, was born in growing up in the South and having so much politics and so much underground and so much racism and so much normalized violence happening and having to make it out of that and having to move forward for that. So there's a lot of different things that have changed since Lang's time. I don't want to have much time. I just want to say a few things are very different. One is that people did try and go off and create nonviolent societies that didn't work. The commune movement didn't really work. People did try and spread meditation and yoga and you know this and that. It didn't work. We still, I mean, you can say things are better now, but no, it didn't work. We still have the same technological, exterminist, violent, racist juggernaut continuing. Esalen. It's now McEsalyn and trying to screen people for craziness to come to the R.D. Lang seminar and you know, connect those dots. So the family is very different since Lang's time. His examples talk about invalid. You're not sad. You're not angry. You're a, something that moms or dads will say to the person who gets labeled schizophrenia, and Lang took that part. And now I think what happens in families is that families are more... We have a permissiveness and a neglect that came in around families, and now it's more like, I want to make sure my kid isn't psychotic so he can go to school, so he doesn't become homeless, so he doesn't become, fall behind in the career structure. The family has become less and less of a social psychological unit since Lang's time, and more of an economic, mass media, <coughs> consumerist unit. So one of the things I think is most, and I'll just start to wrap up. One of the things that's most exciting to me about Kingsley Hall is that it's really a place where people come together to drop normalcy. And I think maybe that's a difference in Soteria. Maybe. Maybe Soteria is like you have the staff and then people come to go through an experience and be guided through a journey. Maybe at Kingsley, I wasn't there, I don't know, I'm just, this is my fanboy interject of playing, right? Uh, maybe at Kingsley it's like people just come to lose normalcy. And people who are not diagnosed or not going crazy will be given a certain kind of permission to be themselves in this experiment of how do we live without the violation of experience. I think we need to bring that back. I think that's the future. Overcoming co-optation and locating psychiatric survivors as human beings deeply affected by violence whose deepest yearning is to overcome violence in all of its forms. Lang says of Freud, he was a hero, he descended to the underworld, now we need to see if we can use his knowledge without using theory as a form of defense. That was his critique of Freud. I think that we need to look at Lang, and we need to respond with a challenge that Lang presents, because there was the macho, drunken, shithead element. There was the pop culture guru element. An example, and I put this on my handouts, an example that he liked to use a lot was you, a clinician sees a psychotic so-called family. And it's kind of like a flock of birds where one person is not in formation of the flock. Right? So that person is out of formation. But what happens if you change your perspective and realize that, wait a second, maybe the entire flock is not out of formation, but the entire flock is off course. And the one bird that's off formation is actually on course from a different perspective. It's an example that Lang used. Do people follow that? Yeah. Lang used that example a lot. I think the challenge of him is how do we do this thing that he did, which was to put a context on people's experience to make it intelligible. That was the, the massive revolution that he was calling for in psychiatry, to understand people in context. We need to do that. We need to ask ourselves, who gets to decide what the context is? Is it an ideal observer? Is it the expert Lang or the, whoever is the pop psychiatrist or psychotherapist of the day? Is it the most senior, powerful person in the room? Or do we need to rethink the power relations and go into a collaborative mode and turn that into a community process? 
What is the context? What indeed is the context? Because the context for me is not you're going through a process of individuation and you're going to come out the side, other side healthier, stronger by facing your psychotic archetypal forces, and then you'll be able to be an independent person in the world. That's not the context for me. That is the context, but it's also there's another context, which is that we live in a violent society that has normalized violence from the biggest level to the micro level, and is turning us very rapidly into monocultured, factory-farmed human beings. That's what's happening in this culture. That's the context we need to talk, talk about. Not the context of let's help you make it through this journey and come out the other side. Well, yes, yes, and we're all on that journey. We're all on that journey. So, how am I doing? You know, it's gonna, they're going to have to tell you that. I can't tell you, but I'm listening. Thank you for not yelling at me. Personally, I've been doing a lot of work around looking at the connections between the mental health system and the larger political system. I don't think we're going to be able to make any kind of meaningful mental health reforms unless we also change the way that our democracy works in the United States. The U.S. also has implications for world democracy. There was a study done about pub public opinion, about policies in the United States, people's opinions about different policy issues. And then they compared people's opinions about public policy, climate change, gay marriage, whatever it is, and they compared it to what governments actually did in terms of actual implemented public policy. And they found that there was absolutely no relationship. That the ordinary person, this is practically a quote from the study, the ordinary person in society has zero impact on public policy decisions. The reason is the way that our politicians are funded the way that the campaigns are funded. So I've been doing a lot of work thinking about and trying to connect with the anti-corruption movement, and that's a practical thing. Ten minutes. Okay. That's a practical thing I would encourage you to do, is to think about those connections. I also have a public, I have a personal ethic of anti-corruption. My policy is um, if the hand that, if, if the hand feeds you, bite it. I identify who is paying my meal ticket, and I criticize them. And if they still pay my meal ticket, then okay. But if they don't, I'm... And this brings me to something I think is very, very important. And it brings me to something that has just said about taking a risk. Lang's book, Divided Self, there may be some controversy about where the title comes from, but my understanding from the John Clay biography is that the title... The divided self was taken as a quote from William James about some people who seem to have a conflict inside of them between natural normal self and the striving for spiritual rebirth. And that reference to William James is very meaningful to me. William James is an incredible believer in human experience, an incredible guide as a psychologist. And Lang often relied on mystical experience to guide us. And I think James speaks to that in validating whatever our mystical experience is, whatever it may be, looking at the sunset, speaking with God, whatever it is. What, he, what Lang says, and I'll wrap up, don't posture, and actually this is, maybe what this, you would like this. This is a really good quote, okay. Don't posture, don't give yourself airs, don't think you're gonna get away with it, don't make excuses, don't kick it around. Who are you trying to kid? A little humility. You've been told as much as you need to know. Shut up and get on with it. There's not much time left. The flood and the fire are upon us. How do we do it? And Lang says very clearly, and thank you for sharing the obvious essay, because this is what this is from. He says, we can put no trust in princes, popes, politicians, Scholars, scientists, no trust in our worst enemy, no trust in our best friends. With the greatest precautions, we may put trust in a source that is much deeper than our egos if we can trust ourselves to have found it, or rather to have been found by it. We may put our trust in a source that is much deeper than our egos if we can trust ourselves to have found it, or rather to have been found by it. 
centrality of trust speaks to me very deeply as mistrust and fear has been governing my whole life and my practice is so much about trust. Trusting the source when you found it. And that's kind of fuzzy. It's a little new age. So let me make it really sharp to you. Let me go back to William James. Let me, let me lay out the challenge that I think all of us are facing. William James writes, The prevalent fear of poverty among the educated classes is the worst moral disease from which our civilization suffers. The prevalent fear of poverty among the educated classes is the worst moral disease from which our civilization suffers. And I study myself and I know that I make so many decisions that are not based on the risk that I'm challenged to take because of my fear of poverty. So that is the challenge I want to take on for myself. I want to take on a challenge of, of really seeing my own shadow, of recognizing that the other is me, that the accusation that I have for the other, the anger that I have at them, is actually towards myself. And also to not lose touch with that anger and that truth and that experience. We're not trying to be neutral facilitators of the revolution here. We're trying to really rise to the risks and challenges of facing violence in ourselves and in society. And I think, it's, I think it's really specific. It's about risking poverty. It's about really risking our material well-being, our mater material safety. Seven minutes. So, you know, where, when I think about all this, you know where I go? You know where I go? Where do people go when I think about that? I think about all this stuff. I just want to scream. I just want to scream. Lang, Lang said, that's a really, he said, quote, that's a serious problem. Where do you go in society to scream? Do people have a place to scream? Do you have a place to scream? How about fucking right here? How about right now? Can you scream with me? Yeah, some of you? It's, it's not mandatory. We do one, two, three, scream. Yeah. I'm getting some. One, two, three. <laughs> Welcome, Leslin, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> We have about five minutes left. Anybody have any questions, comments for Will? Screams? I have a comment. Go ahead. Having spent most of the 70s with my yeah, yeah. His household, I, I was saying that having spent most of the 70s with Lang and the household, I just want you to know, Will, this is the first time since then that I've been in the presence of someone who really, really does get it. And without having Wait, is that is that me or this one? It's it's all. <laughs> <of them. laughs> and I, I mean, I've talked to people mm. for years because our Ronnie's influence on all the things they're doing, and they're I get blank stares. And I just want to get wow. I haven't met you. I've heard about you. Thank you. But I really am moved by by your presence. So thank you. 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 I would add one thing. Please, please. Yes. Say it again, the drunken. I, I, I Paul, whoever he no, is, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm macho, macho, drunken shithead? Yeah, macho, misogynist, yes. drunken yes. shithead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. God love. Kelly? Can I add another word? Drunken homophobic. Oh, yes, thank you. That's how can I forget that? Except for the wrestling with Sean Connery. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's that was very erotic. I have a question to yeah. I want to especially thank you for bringing in the combination of William James, which you mentioned to fear of poverty.
property, a ruling, blockage, anything happening. Thank you, because we do belong to a lineage. This is what I'm trying to say to see you. Your lineage is important, and, and the quality of the lineage goes back to the Greeks, back to the Buddha, before the Buddha, pre-Socratics. There's a clear yeah, lineage all part. the way through, mm. but we have to listen to the closer in lineage, and we have to see which people followed and which people didn't, and you're carrying that lineage. And I'm so grateful, I'm so tired of having to, in a way, act like it's not important that people want everything to be economically viable and do business. Because the two things so often don't go together. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Rich Jaffa over there. Thank you. One thing I experienced with Ronnie was that uh, you never knew what would come next whether it was in a private conversation, in a private home, or in a restaurant, or in a large public conference, you never knew what would come next. And I felt this a little bit with you too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank Kali for that. I'm really, that's, I just want, that's, I mean, this is the fanboy in me, I really, I, he taps something, the people who gather around him connect with something, and that if I can feel connected with colleagues, it's really very meaningful to me, so thank you for that. Thank you. I would like to um, make a remark on how you went meta with our consciousness now, that uh, the family is creating a more monetized child, and that that's the larger yes. uh, problem. It, 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 Lang's day, it was obvious that we were shitting on the planet, and he was very aware of environmental issues, but this is new, and it has to do, it's been being supported and focused by the digital revolution, mm -hmm. and we're going toward artificial intelligence, uh -huh. and this, um, you know, uh, change is something that we need to discuss, I believe, at some point in, in this during this week. Yeah. This is a fundamental change. We don't even understand what consciousness is yet, and yet we're talking about uploading ourselves to computers. Yeah. And this is nutty. Yes. And, but this is what uh, uh, parents are training their children to follow because of the threat of being left behind financially. Yes. Thank, thank you for saying that. And I also I want to I call myself on some of my own sexism because I had a whole, I really want to say that that's the big difference now. The legacy and then the women's movement has changed so much in our thinking. And the, one of the reasons that people want computers and iPhones and Furbies and robots to take care of their children, which is happening and is coming in a really big way, robots taking care of children is coming in a really big way, because we're not, we're not doing the number one demand of the women's movement since the 60s, which is, Socialized childcare. We don't even have Europe levels, much less um, anything that's actually going to give people time to properly raise children. So, thank you for, thank you for, thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, I'm very grateful to you for how you spoke about the trust. And for me, it's been very important as a vessel. You know, one has a imagination, a vision. And you know you have to bring it together. And there's all sorts of challenges and doubts and things thrown at what in this way. And because, well, I would say in the power of the spiritual world, as you become a vessel, we get our stuff out of the way so that it can work through us. And um, I think that's really key to work with. You know, I feel it's a bit risky to speak this way, but I know that the people who I've known who committed suicide, mm -hmm. that what I've tried to do, in a way, um, I see it as a sacrifice. They have sacrificed their lives for us so that we wake up mm -hmm. and do something about it, so more, more suicides don't have to happen. And I totally agree with you. It's how do we bring these ideas, visions down, and do it. Bloody hell, do it. And if we have that momentum, you'd be amazed. There are times when 
I'll speak to those who are on the other side of the threshold. You know this term, let me sleep on it? Yeah. It used to be very understandable that you were going to ask those people who had crossed a threshold, who yeah. are today. We just don't see them. The ancestors. And there are times when I heard that, and in the morning, I get an email responding to that. A person in Oregon who wants to do fundraising for inner time. And it's like, and so they're thinking, where can I turn? Where's the support out there? And we can't do it alone. Beautiful. We need each other here, but we also have to remember it's this way too. Yeah. Beautiful. So I'm very grateful that we You make me think, uh, and we'll wrap up just because we're out of time, but it makes me think of if we're not, if we let go of some of our fear of poverty, which is the moral disease, the greatest moral disease of our civilization amongst the educated classes, if we let go of some of that, where do we, where do we get our trust? What, what can we hold on to? And we have to somehow trust that it is the entire thing is going to support us somehow. And that's very hard because money is seems like it can buy you safety, but it really can't. It's an illusion. So we should, I want to thank everybody. I, I want to remind you, I did, I op uploaded the 26 page outline version so you can see everything I didn't say on the web. There's cards there and I'm here, I think partly, mostly. Also, <laughs> thanks to other parts. So thank you very much thank everyone. You. Are we taking a break now? Um, what are we doing now? Yeah, yes. Take, uh, let's take a break. Let's take yeah. a break. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I think he may have been right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's no way that we're not getting any police through there. I just can't see it positively. But I agree. I, I think it's only uh, tuned in to see what you are. I
Being in time is just a replay Principles are meaning that 
I just wanted to say, yes. Helen Keller would be very proud of you. Aww.